This month's theme is Beyond, and it's my first Creative Mornings, and I'm really excited to be here and get to tell you a little bit about my story as I've built my career working in fields beyond my expertise. So my ability to work in fields beyond my expertise is largely inspired by my family and their willingness to take risks and support my own. In the early 60s, my family was living in Houston. My parents were parents of two young daughters, my sisters, and my dad called my mom from work with a question of, do you want to go to Tripoli, Libya? My mom took her, my two sisters to the library to do a little research, cracked open the letter L uh, encyclopedia, and under Libya saw a photo of a man standing next to a camel in a palm tree. She walked my uh, sisters home, waited for my dad to arrive home from work, and said, let's go, let's do this. And in Tripoli, my two brothers were born, and now my parents have four young children living in Tripoli for a few years and are transferred to Egypt. And they were able to stay there for a few years as well until they had to evacuate for the Six Day War. They evacuated to Athens, Greece and lived there for a couple of years before then moving back to the States, but to Oklahoma, where I was born. <laughs> so I obviously got the exotic end of their uh, travels. <clears throat> and I certainly got to see a lot of pictures from their adventures, which is a great motivator uh, to see outside the and beyond the borders of Oklahoma. But Bartlesville, Oklahoma, where I was born, was a unique and interesting place. It was the headquarters of the oil company Phillips 66, had a large R&D contingency as well as the uh, operational management, and a lot of international expatriates. There were only 40,000 people in the town, but it afforded a large set of mentors which were in the science and engineering fields that were really inspirational and influential for me. Those folks were largely my friend's parents. And another ins inspiration was Frank Lloyd Wright's only skyscraper in all of his career exists in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. <laughs> it's uh, the Price Tower. And after it was completed, a lot of his students and uh, protégés stuck around to design homes and buildings throughout the town. Truly an inspiration to be amongst that architecture. And at the age of 17, the inspiration from my family, my friends and mentors, as well as uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's work, pushed me to do my own experiment, which was within uh, the science fair. And within the realm of fluid dynamics, I was working on the question of whether bubbles were attracted to each other in liquid. Uh, I happened to win the state science fair and was given a prize to work in an internship at Brookhaven National Laboratory in uh, Long Island. The National Lab Network is a legacy of the Manhattan Project. So as you can imagine, that now being run by the DOE, there were uh, particle accelerators and colliders. When I arrived, there was one student from each state representing the uh, scientific community and one uh, student from eight foreign countries was the only one that hadn't graduated high school, and I was certainly the only one that had not taken a physics course yet. So I felt out of place. By the end of that summer, I'd made a lot of strong friendships, but didn't think I was coming back to the DOE for sure. Uh, that fall, I found out of the 58 students, they were bringing seven back for a job the next summer, and I happened to be one of them. In my return, I was now elbow deep in physics, something I had not anticipated, and the decision for me uh, at that point, working with doctorates and uh, folks that were already in higher education was, I needed to go get a college degree. And I decided to go beyond my expertise at that point into another field of bioengineering. Uh, looking around the country, there were only about five of those in the country, and Texas A&M was one of them. And that's how I ended up in Texas. Got to pursue my dream of working on the man-machine interface while at uh, Texas A&M. But then I also found out that a lot of it was prosthetics and pacemaker uh, development and not necessarily my area of interest. And I sought something that I'd been reading a lot about, which was artificial intelligence, by looking through the, the course offerings and finding a job with a professor of AI in the computer science department. I was then working at the Center for Fuzzy Logic and Robotics with some really cool toys. Uh, if you can imagine, Back in the day, uh, robots that looked like insects were a very big thing. 
the Department of Entomology was working with my lab and approached us with an opportunity to work on a web-based software and database uh, for a taxonomical database that they were working on in, in the Department of Entomology. My advisor and mentor offered this as a project that I might take on. I took this idea home to my housemates that were including my uh, childhood friend, who was a much smarter guy than I was, and w was also working for the university, and we decided that we could make about 10 times the wage of our work-study hourly wages if we just started a company, which cost about $50 in Texas at the time. And uh, thus, Navigo was born in 1995, co-founding with some pretty humble aspirations. But if you can imagine uh, one 18-year-old and one 20-year-old as co-founders of a professional services firm, uh, we, we were not, if you saw the slide uh, coming up here, we were really not folks that looked employable at the time. Um, so we decided not to work with anyone within the state of Texas. And we looked beyond the borders uh, to first go through a sales process of uh, cold calling and emails because with our initial humble aspirations, we then saw Netscape going public through 1995 and the web taking off and then it was obvious that it was gonna be uh, revolutionary. So in, in a broader aspiration of uh, expanding our business, the, <clears throat> the realization of, of uh, wh whether or not we could call someone ahead, establish a rapport and some legitimacy, and then on a road trip, visit our siblings who happened to live, fortunate for us, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Chicago, and New York at the time. <clears throat> and they couldn't turn us away as easily once we had established that rapport. And along the way, we were figuring out how to operate and grow the business. It included, uh, with our funds coming from university as a client, us funding the pursuit of new business that, let's say for instance, we're driving to New York and we're waiting on that next check from our client. We didn't quite have that yet, so we were returning clothes that were gifted to us in like Nashville to pay for gas to get to New York. Uh, there was also uh, consideration of how we might be reached when we were mobile and to keep costs low versus having a brick phone in the car, we carried a beeper that was a phone number for Navigo when you tried to reach us. Uh, you were asked to politely wait, you were asked politely to wait, uh, and we might be going down an interstate, get beeped and need to careen down an exit ramp to find a payphone to then dial into a number to those patiently waiting, but usually these folks had already hung up. So um, lessons learned in, in uh, corporate communications. And after all that travel, we did have some success in finding business outside the, the borders of Texas, but we finally landed a big fish in our own backyard. I was uh, just 21 and down on 6th Street at Maggie Mays, introducing myself to someone taking photographs of people drinking Corona beer. And uh, talking to him about Navigo, he told me about how much the brewers of Corona beer, Grupo Modelo, were in need of digital service and expertise. I went home and did some research, uh, pitched their US subsidiary in San Antonio, and landed uh, a deal to, to work with Corona for, for years to come. At that point, they were becoming the number one import to the US over Heineken for the first time since Prohibition. They were exporting to over 100 countries and we got to meet those importers. Uh, really a cultural expansion in our view beyond the borders of the US and uh, ended up being serendipitous for us as we grew the company later. And we got to do some really exotic things like attend in Mexico City the International Macarena Championships. <laughs> uh, but it really put a lot of gas in the tank. And it became more and more apparent that we had a lifetime of opportunity ahead of us and we needed to find a company culture. Primarily, we wanted to learn every day at Navigo. We knew that we would be more, worth more in the market if that were the case. Kind of obvious, but uh, we also realized that employees of Navigo were looking for career development to move on to the next thing eventually and we wanted to recognize that up front. So we turned traditional uh, management on its head by a credo that we shared with our team that the door is always open for you to come talk to management, but the door is also always open for you to leave the company, and if you wish to leave Navigo, we encourage you to do so. Uh, also, if you want to become an entrepreneur, we encourage you to do that as well, and if you've got an idea, 
share it with us, and if we think it has legs, we'll try to help give it wings. A number of companies have been born out of Navigo as a result, and it's been an interesting way for us to work within the enterprise software realm, but as well the bleeding edge of software uh, within startups. You know, as years have gone on, I could uh, best describe what is formed with our mature company uh, with work that came out later than really we had laid the foundation for our culture. It was best articulated in 2008 by Daniel Pink. And the, the primary uh, focus for us as curators of the community of clients, vendors, partners, and employees at Navigo is mastery, autonomy, and purpose. And you guys might have heard of this before, but it's truly what motivates, it's, motivates us at work outside of where the decimal lies on your paycheck. We found that this also applies to our interaction with clients as well. And as an extension, we can uh, give you an example that we want employees to become masters of, and clients to become masters in their domain uh, every day. As we said, learning every day. And the autonomy part is super important. We want, once you've received what you need from us as an organization, the chance to, to go out and create on your own without a lot of uh, intervention if you do not desire that intervention. And then purpose, we need to be stating purpose, our, the purpose of our work clearly every day and know that uh, we have the, the wonderful opportunity to say no more than we say yes to projects. And as a result, we select those that we find a shared and common purpose with the uh, client that we're engaging with. The other uh, thing that we're finding surprising you know, throughout the 22 years of existence at Navigo is when we engage with a client, we are finding from day one a way to be replaced so that we're not a barnacle on that ship decades later uh, just, just on it for the ride. And we want to be replaceable so that we can impart our expertise into the organization and then move on and be at the highest value for, for any of our projects. So now, you know, many years later, Navigo is a, a mature business and we're a software science and engineering firm. We're building new software for the largest institutions in the world across a really wide breadth of uh, industries. Can't go into all of those today, but as I mentioned, we're also backing startups born from Navigo. And I've tried to lead by example as well by starting companies outside Navigo myself. A couple of those I'd like to share with you today just because they're brazen and audacious in their mission and uh, they're early enough that I've not shared much about them and uh, there's a call to action ahead and about two very important issues. I believe citizens need advocates, advocates need stories, and stories need data. We're in an interesting time. Um, this is not a political organization. This is a, an organization that we've co-founded called Markup that is with a goal to add transparency to DC through tracking changes in legislation, regulation, and the courts, uh, identifying the drivers of those changes, and then analyzing the support and opposition for that change. That opposition and support could be at the level of your representative and, and uh, the legislative branch, or it could be in journalistic op-ed or across the uh, social media graph. Once this data is in aggregate, you can use it to uh, provide some really wonderful insights, and we all found out how good predictive analytics were in November for the election, but you can, you, you can combine uh, the, this rich history of our country and, and then look to what might be a conflict with a proposed change is one example of uh, the utility for markup and its product. I also believe oceans need advocates, advocates need stories, and stories need data. In a landlocked place like Austin, which is uh, its closest port in the Gulf, it seems a little odd to be working on uh, ocean exploration, but that is a company that I've co-founded, which focuses on the oceans of data that are out there and is well undiscovered. Its name is X994, and we're using technology for mapping and observation uh, through robotics and satellite imagery uh, in observation of our uh, Earth's oceans. This was. Uh, a team that was assembled as a result of competing in the X Prize, and you know, previously I showed you my a picture of myself 22 years ago, and then now this is a contemporary picture with a bunch of salty dogs. And you'd notice that I, I didn't get the memo on wearing plaid that day, but I am, am working with some true geniuses in in their respective fields around ocean exploration. It's an example of me engaging 
folks beyond my expertise to, to make a difference in uh, companies that I found or work with. We know more about the surface of the moon and, the, and Mars than we do about our own oceans. There's only about five to 15% of our oceans that's been mapped. And with the current technology, it's gonna take about a thousand years to, to fully map our Earth's oceans. It's not something we should wait on. With the uh, X Prize, the Shell Ocean Discovery X Prize that we are, have entered, we've become semi-finalists as a team to deploy an autonomous system of robots to go to depths of up to 4,000 meters in the ocean to, to test technology that just does not exist today, which is obviously the purpose of the X Prize. It's a super exciting endeavor, wildly audacious, and uh, we believe we have an entry that could truly win this thing, and it's all based out of here in Austin. We're also the only, maybe not the only, but we are the truly entrepreneurial entry. Most com uh, competitors are from Asia, the US, and Europe. The Asian teams are largely backed by governments, the US teams are largely backed by academic institutions, and the European teams are backed by hybrids thereof. We're bootstrapped, and uh, we are duct tape and bailing wire with uh, 40 foot long ocean robots going to, to depths and doing things uh, autonomously that uh, have not been done before. We're in a sore need of rendering of, of our vision, but this is some really cool stuff that you can see a, a shoreside a location where we're managing mission control, our toes are not getting wet, we're communicating via satellite and technologies like Project Loon uh, to surface vessels that are also unmanned, and those are launching and recovering uh, the ocean robots that are going to depth, but are also sensing things beyond the uh, bathymetry or the topography of the seafloor, they're identifying species and then other biological features and chemical features, uh, be it the, let's say the pH of the water. So it's a, it's a combination of, of both vision and light and sound uh, to, to know more about our Earth's oceans. From the sky and in space, we're deploying cameras that will not be going to depth, but instead looking at the oceans up to, let's say 30 meters. And this is where 90% of maritime accidents occur. With the resolution that we're providing in, in our uh, work to deploy these cameras to space, can look at the health of a coral reef in a new way. Before you were looking at huge tiles of whether or not they were white or another color. And now at the resolution we're speaking to, we can actually see the growth or retraction of the, of the coral reef, which is gonna give us a lot of insight into uh, how we might be impacting the oceans. So I've chosen some purposeful missions well beyond my expertise as an uh, expert in software. These are enormous entities that we cannot see into that happen to also not be in Texas. <clears throat> but they both need transparency and I'm often reminded of how my parents embarked on an adventure after only reading about it. And I hope to continue to say yes when called upon for audacious endeavors in areas well beyond my expertise here forward. Thanks for listening today.